So one of the first things you'll find when you look into a vertical farming space is the lack of experienced or specialized talent. A lot of people sort of come in from backgrounds that are not directly involved in CEA, but are sort of adjacent to them. So as a professor at McGill, um, who teaches courses like bio, environmental engineering, could you share maybe your overall outlook on the talent issue within the industry and maybe like some points of hope as well? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, well, so if you look at it from CA, so controlled environment agriculture pro probably had three, three feeder directions. So there was the, the world of, um, let's start off top end to the bottom end. And so the top end is probably NASA type research. So the idea that you have to have full environmental control. You could also say like Navy subs kind of fall into the same category. So either you're deep underwater or you're up in space and you have to be able to control for all these factors. Mm -hmm. So be able to control light, temperature, humidity, et cetera, work your way through the whole system. And so NASA funded a fair bit of this. Um, the Air Force has done a little bit on that. Um, they, they've kind of stopped lately, but they were some of the early one. And then the Navy did it, obviously, as part of the submarines because people would spend months down in those locations. And then through those operations, we ended up with a few random selection places where you'd try to grow food in very remote locations like bottom of this um, Antarctica or other possible places. So it was a very, very select group of people that wanted to get into it because of that. So you had to have the NASA side. Then there was the cannabis world. And predominantly that was the, the black market suppliers. So those were self-taught individuals. They'd take some things from the, the NASA perspective, but it was rare that they would be trained in that. There was a few cases of it, but I'd say it was usually more they, they read whatever they could. Um, and if you went to the hydroponics world um, or hydroponics store, you'd usually find those individuals and a few NASA people it would be the, that kind of was that way until about 10 years ago. Uh, and then the, the third kind of industry would be the ones who were doing greenhouse. So that'd be the agricultural engineers or the plant scientists, horticulturists, were the, the three training vectors out of that. So one's high end, um, considered the, the top end NASA kind of research on that with a few other smatterings on that. Then there was the bottom end, and I'm not meaning bottom as in um, people-wise, just uh, the industry as such didn't have training because they weren't allowed to. So it was a very much hands-on approach, learning it on the fly kind of thing. And then there was the two groups, usually at an ag, ag university, uh, with an agricultural engineering bent or a horticultural bent. Um, and the two sometimes interact with each other. The difficulty that happened over the last 30 years, agricultural engineering and even horticulture have been decimated from a training perspective and nobody really wanted to go into those. And so in the horticultural world or plant science world, they became focused on genetics and only genetics, so not production methodologies. Ag engineers predominantly design tractor design, but we'd done things before that. But that, that's kind of what held us together was tractor and vehicle design. And it's been in the last 10 years that it started to come out um, that we moved past that so that we're actually trying to expand more into the greenhouse, further designs and more controlled environment, remote sensing, et cetera, we, we walk our way through. Um, and the, the challenges is that when I meant decimated, quite almost most land grant universities in the States or agricultural campuses in Canada had an agricultural engineering component and almost all of them shut the programs down, started in the late seventies and walked all the way up until just a couple of years ago was the last couple of ones that were shut down. And now that we're seeing enrollments go back up and people actually care about these things, we're having to try to steal them from elsewhere. So then we end up taking mechanic from the engineering perspective. We take mechanical engineers, civil or electrical engineers or chemical engineers to fill those voids. And we find that they're still lacking. They don't have an understanding of a lot of these flexibility out of the systems. And so it still is a, a huge issue. Same things happening on the on the uh, the plant science or the horticulture side where mo most people ended up going into the genetics. So their understanding of growing plants is actually quite poor. They know how to, they know what the genes are inside these things, but I won't say that they actually have a good understanding of how to grow this. There's obviously exceptions in all of these cases. And so we're finding that it, a lot of places are trying to rebuild these operations. So in the United States, there's been a big push within the ag engineering programs, but also the horticultural programs to try to merge, not make them the same, but actually have like a bridge person in between. So a, a professor that is in charge of these controlled environments. And so I've been seeing a lot of universities building this up. So originally it was a few. So here in Canada, it was basically Guelph was it. 
Um, then I came here to McGill, so we have two for all intents and purposes now. So we've doubled, so congrats okay. to us. But we used to have Laval, which was exceedingly strong, and it's kind of dropped, it dropped off almost to zero. But now they're making an effort to try to start bringing these trainings back in and start trading these up down in the States. You could go through the really big universities that had that were Purdue, Rutgers, Arizona, Michigan State, probably missing a couple more community colleges are starting to do larger trainings on these. So, so there is an effort underway. I will not say that we're overly good at it yet, but it takes years for this to build up to the point. But with all these additions, like out of my lab alone, I've graduated. I'm over 50 graduate students that have graduate masters and PhDs. And if you take the, the undergraduates, uh, there will be hundreds that will claim that they have this expertise because they've either worked with me or worked in my lab or did design projects on these things. So we are starting to bridge that. It's just we're going from where NASA needed 10 to now needing hundreds of thousands, and we just don't have that number of people. And then we run into cases where there's people who go, well, I'm an expert in it because I have grown plants inside of my house. And it's not quite the same thing, commercial at scale. And it's the same issue that underground growers had also in the black market is that they would grow six to maybe 30 plants in their basement. And some of these companies like Aurora or Canopy or Hexo, whoever you want to go with, they're growing hundreds of thousands of plants. And so you can't use the same techniques as you did when you were managing 30. So it's building. It's just going to take a while. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate those insights. Definitely seems like it's more of a supply side problem than a demand. Um, just sort of as a quick follow up, have you had any sort of issue with um, any of your students who graduated maybe struggling to find employment or anything like that directly into the field or which right away like people were clamoring to be able to get access to them? I, I ha will say that I've had two students come to me and say they couldn't find a job out of the hundreds, maybe a thousand or so that we've had through our program. I thought it was amusing. I contacted, I said, contact anybody you can. They said, well, couldn't find anybody. I contact three of my contacts, three or sorry, let's say five of my contacts, four out of the five said they're wanting to hire somebody in the next month. <laughs> so, so demand is there. It's just, I don't think those individuals looked very hard or didn't know where to look. Fair enough. Quick, quick one for question on that. Um, what, what do you think led to this um, drop <clears throat> that you're mentioning recently in the last 10 years? Because surprisingly in the last 10 years, we're seeing you know a huge spike in controlled environment agriculture, um, you know, taking over. I was a, it was a few things. There was a short sightedness of upper administration. They thought genetics was gonna solve the world was one. Mm -hmm. Two, for some reason in the mid 80s to 90s, agriculture became a almost a derogatory term. You're trying to describe how the world was being destroyed. And I, I blame it on the people who were pushing climate change um, narratives, basically said agriculture, cows and beef are destroying the planet. And you can group it however you want. Uh, and you can narrow it down or not. But it basically said that I, we'd have students come in and says we do, when I first got hired at McGill, I would teach about like a pig barn and people would say, I don't want to learn about pig barns because they're destroying the planet. I'm like, sure. Except when you go eat ribs and then you have to have pig, I'm sorry, or bacon or whatever it is you want to eat. And they go, well, I don't eat those things. Okay, great. What do you eat? Then they'd list all their things. And I'm like, well, then you need to know, like, if you're only going to be a vegan, great. How do you process soybean? Like that's a, that's a plant processing facility. And they're like, no, no, that's industrial agriculture. I'm like, Okay, there's not a tofu facility out there that doesn't use industrial scale processing. I'm sorry. Like if you can be as vegan as you want and it's almost impossible to make a full food stock unless you're going to go mass production. You just can't make money on it. It's too cheap. So and these people just didn't understand. And now now that we're starting to see the narrative spun that goes, well, we're not going to try to. Well, war in Ukraine has been quite good for agriculture, to be perfectly honest not good for the rest of the world, but from an agricultural perspective, we understand that if we're killing off people and not allowing food to flow for places that are generating it to places where they're needed, people starve. Like, it's not shocking. Like, my, as soon as the war in Ukraine started, I'm like, the biggest consequence is parts of Africa are going to starve to death. Like, they're dependent on that food. And having the mechanisms to stop that just caused so much turmoil. So now people are aware that food is a serious issue and we have to take it seriously. So agriculture has moved back up through the rankings. 
But for the longest time, I, I'd almost describe it as a four letter word. If you said you were in farming, that should get spit on and say, well, you're destroying the planet. I'm like, well, not so much. I'm trying to keep us alive. So, so it's a shift of mindsets and a shift of perspective. And now students see that there's a, a reason to go into this. Like people, students would come into my program, so by resource engineering at McGill, and say, I want to go into soil and water because we're about to run out of water. My standard argument, is, we're not going to run out of water. We're going to run out of water that you can drink. So you have to figure out how to treat the water and how to manage it. And that's a different issue than running out of it. But we could run out of food. Like you see what a famine is. That's running out of food. And they never thought that was going to be a serious issue. But now we're running into those places where people can see this possibility. We're, we don't have the buffer we used to have. Well, it was the big thing was 30 years ago, we had plenty of food. You could get anything you wanted all the time. So why did you care about food?